Hey there. Um, just so you know, a lot of people asked, since I suddenly announced I was going out of town for three days, people thought there might have been a death or something. No, my wife and my kid are on spring break and we just want to get out of town. We're going to go uh, to another city and do some things with the kid. <laughs> uh, short vacation. I don't know if I'll get to do many videos, but um, or if any. I always try on vacations to do some, but we'll just have to see. Uh, but I do want to... I woke up early with kind of a burden. Uh, you know, there is a reason why we practice biblical separation. And, and it's biblical because it's in the Bible and we're commanded to do it. Uh, we do not wrestle with flesh and blood. And when you are dealing with error concerning the person and work of Christ and the implications for justification or sanctification or reward, if you're dealing with error in those areas, you're not dealing with just getting it wrong. You're dealing with a spirit of error. Um, Peter warns about watching yourself lest you fall from your own steadfastness and be carried off with the error of the wicked. And Paul doesn't call uh, these things just wrong. Like, you know, oh, well, they're mostly right, but they made a mistake. Uh, no, he calls it doctrines of demons. And he says people are going to go after seducing spirits and they will not tolerate the sound doctrine. So there's sound doctrine and doctrine of demons. There's only two sources for the things we think, ultimately. It doesn't come from man. It comes either from God or from Satan and his world. And we've been called out, right? And and we've been, we are sanctified in the truth. Um, so you can't stand in the way of error and maintain any real separation or sanctification. It impacts your Christian life. And that's why Psalm 1 starts, the, you know, the Psalms start with, blessed is, is the person who does not stand um, in the way of the wicked or sit in the seat of the scorner, Right? But his delight is in the law of the Lord. You say, oh, law, commandments. No, the law was the entirety of the word. Uh, in that sense, it's the Torah. But uh, the point is, we need to have, we if we're going to grow in the Christian life and in our freedom in Christ and not be brought into bondage and not wither ourselves, we have to keep our roots near the water and we need to be delighting in the word and we need to not stand in the path of error. I mean, that's basic. It's the first thing we need to learn is to separate from error. And we don't always know how to recognize error. And that's the problem in the Christian life. The reason people are suffering in the Christian life and spend years in condemnation uh, and in uh, defeat and witheredness and their relationship with the Lord seems all dried up is because, because ultimately of error in their thinking and belief concerning the person and work of Christ. And that error is to be is to be identified and warred against. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, in that we cast down uh, vain imaginations and every high and lofty thought that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. What is that? That is the path of mind renewal, which is a, here in that sense described as spiritual warfare. It is, a, it is a war, and we're to put our armor on because we're standing in the evil day, right? And we need to be clothed with all the armor which is con, con, which is the armor of light and the armor of truth and each element of the armor in Ephesians 6 for example is speaking of something about the person and work of Christ 
that we need to lay hold of and apprehend and defend in our own mind against the assaults of the enemy and the war he's waging. And he does it through evil spirits. And he does it through religion. And ultimately, these things have to have expression in somebody's mouth for us to cut, you know, lay hold of these things that stumble us. So they're connected to people. So there's no way to turn from the doctrine without turning from the people that espouse it. Uh, and I learned that the hard way because I wanted to join this group so bad uh, many years ago. And there were some red flags. And one of them was that they were right on justification, but they taught that you could lose your reward uh, and your inheritance, which would mean practically that in the in during the millennium, you would be in the outer darkness, weeping and gnashing your teeth, and you had to overcome in order to not find yourself in that kind of position <laughs> and I knew that was wrong from the get-go but I said it was a secondary issue you know I tried to t a couple people talked to me about it and we agreed to disagree yet stay in fellowship um, now that wasn't just an error about that wasn't just a disagreement about whether the Nephilim were really descendants of fallen angels or whether tongues is real you know this was much more serious because it impacts your view of the sufficiency of the work of Christ and what justification actually secures I, I didn't really understand that um, I didn't know that rewards was such a big deal <laughs> Uh, that, that, that our concept of rewards, working for a wage, serving mammon, was a big deal. You know, you cannot have two masters. You'll either serve, you'll, you'll hate the one and love the other. And if you serve mammon, eventually you're going to hate God because you're going to think he's unfair when you see him rewarding people that don't deserve it. <laughs> um, that's what, that's what, that, that so anyway. Uh, I ignored that. And at first it was a peripheral issue because they weren't going to bring it up very often um, because they knew I wouldn't join them. Uh, but I joined. And the next 10 years of my life were hell on earth. Uh, they had everything seemingly right and could speak so well about justification but in the background, there was this concept uh, with the rewards and being in outer darkness. Now, that came from confusing the earthly ministry of Jesus with the ministry of Paul, or the ascended Christ, and not separating and dividing, rightly dividing, between what was revealed before and after the death and resurrection of Christ. It was not known clearly that there was a group of people that were in Christ, hidden in him, as a result of his work, who were co-heirs with him, and were not heirs of their own inheritance, and, and rewarded for their own service, but were actually partakers of his. That was spelled out more clearly after the resurrection of Christ. Prior to that, Jesus spoke primarily in parable when it came to spiritual truth, because uh, not to reveal it, but to hide it <laughs> and protect it from the fallen angels so that they could not tamper with the doctrines um, before the spirit of truth came to uh, shepherd, you know, his work to shepherd us into truth and keep us in the truth uh, and also to protect his plan, you know. But uh, everything was spoken as under the law in the synoptic gospels jesus was a minister to the circumcision to confirm the promises to the fathers and speak as one under the law to those under the law that's what they wanted understood now there's gospel in it 
because he's speaking about himself and the promises to the fathers, but he's not clearly spelling out justification the way we have it in Romans based on his blood being presented in the heavens uh, and all the implications of that and what it means to be a member of the body of Christ. And see, if we don't recognize that distinction, then we read Matthew 24 and 25 and see the parable of the you know, ten virgins and the parable of the servants and the wedding garment and the feast and these people in outer darkness and we assume that they're regenerated believers who are being disciplined during the millennium. That's where that's how we got that. Uh, we were so right on so many things in the Bible and yet blind when it came to this aspect of the person and work of Christ as justification secures our inheritance and reward. Uh, and you think, well, that's secondary. That's what I thought. I mean, I'm not going to break fellowship over something like that because I didn't understand it would actually... Uh, change my view of Jesus Christ and make him into the hard taskmaster. Baal is a false Christ, an antichrist, who m makes his way into the minds of Christians or, or God's people uh, and replaces Christ through erroneous doctrine that affects our view of the person and work of Christ. And he replaces Christ. And you say, well, I don't believe that. Oh, really? You ever celebrate Christmas or Easter? Those are Baal's birthday, not Jesus. <laughs> he is definitely present um, in Christendom. And he's promoted by a spirit called Jezebel. Jezebel is the priestess of Baal. And she brought Baal worship into the camp in Israel and replaced the priests with servants of Baal. So the people thought they were serving Jehovah, but were actually doing the will of Baal when they uh, stoned Naboth for blasphemy. They thought they were serving Jehovah, but they were actually doing the will of the priestess of Baal. And that is a type, and there's a real spirit behind that, uh, that wants to exalt himself over God's people. And he uses religion and manipulation to damage our conscience and make us tolerate things we shouldn't. And that's why Jesus said in the church of Thyatira, this thing I have against you, that you tolerate that woman Jezebel who teaches my servants to, you know, commit fornication and eat things sacrificed to idols. <laughs> Sorry. Um, it's through our toleration. And the reason we tolerate is not because of our evil nature, but because of the good parts of our nature that want to be kind and loving. And that's why John, the apostle of love, <laughs> said that if somebody comes to you with a corruption of the doctrine of Christ, you're not even to receive them into your home or bid them Godspeed, lest you partake of their sins. That's the same thing Peter says, do not Stand, fall away from your own steadfastness and be carried off with the error of the wicked. It's a spirit. It's a flow. Uh, and I see people today that are now caught up in the exact same things that they were calling out last year. Uh, having the same kind of filthy dreams about the truth and saying the same kind of things and associating in the same way and doing the same kind of damage. Uh, and it's because I was close to these people. So I know the whole story because they left room in their heart through toleration. Uh, in some cases when they should have closed the door, when you see someone turn against the doctrine of Christ who once professed it, you are you cannot keep associating with them. You rebuke a heretic twice and then refuse them, according to the scripture. Uh, and it's for the protection of the truth and your own sake. We are not that strong. And when I was in that group, I thought I went in knowing that they had a different view 
knowing that it was a really bad thing, but willing to set it aside because I considered it secondary, thinking it wouldn't affect me. And yet, it brought me into such bondage, it absolutely destroyed my marriage, it destroyed my whole Christian life, because I became a slave to trying to stay out of the outer darkness. <laughs> Eventually, they convinced me. See, it's not just an intellectual thing. I thought if I had good intellect and, and knew that it was wrong, then I'd be able to associate with them and not be affected by it. But Paul said a little leaven leavens the whole lump. And Jesus said there's like the, the kingdom of heaven is like a woman who hid leaven in the meal until the whole thing was leavened. And eventually that doctrine works itself into all of the things that we're teaching and doing. That, and that wasn't the only doctrine, but that was the main one that absolutely brought me into captivity and replaced Christ for me with the hard taskmaster, with Baal. I couldn't, you know, even though I knew I was justified, I could not solve the problem of my conscience, and there was just a dark cloud over my conscience. And, uh, you know, it's the same thing that I covered a couple days ago with that confession of sin thing, you know, that... This, this idea that you're being pulled out of Christ and you're walking in darkness and all these things. And it comes from a not just a wrong interpretation of First John, but a demonic interpretation of First Wrong. That's how we have to that's how we have to identify it. It's not just wrong, it's demonic. When you're touching the person and work of Christ and you're getting it wrong, it's because of a spirit of error. It's doctrines of demons. You say, yeah, but people aren't demons. No, they're not. We are just sheep that are easily led astray. And that's why the scripture tells us we have to be so careful and watch ourselves and our doctrine and guard the truth and guard our crown. And why we're presented as standing in the evil day, clothed with the armor of God, because we wrestle not with flesh and blood. Um, when I was in that group... Uh, see the 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 uh, the doctrine that you could be in the outer of the darkness during the millennium came from the doctrine of rewards uh, presented in a way of earning a wage, you know, for service, and that came from the Synoptic Gospels, not even Paul's. You know, Paul, when Paul speaks about the doctrine of rewards, he he. He even tells us that just that the the reward is of grace. It can't be of works; otherwise, it's no longer of grace. In Romans four, even the reward. Okay, if you get that wrong, you you don't you won't understand the work of Christ in your life. Um, it, your life will be a mix of him and you. That's called syncretism. It's called Galatianism. Um, and it is a spiritual adultery because. You, you, through it, another husband comes in, okay, which is Baal. <laughs> it's a false Christ. Even though you're justified, see, we, even though we're justified, our mind is still a mess. That's why we have to be renewed in the spirit of our mind. We have to be not conformed to this world, but transformed by the renewing of our mind. Uh, that we may prove the will of God, you know. We have to be, we have to grow in the knowledge of the truth, we start out mostly in error, and that error came from the world system, which was rooted in demonic uh, sources. And the, the Christian world is demonic as well. The religious world is even more demonic than the secular, materialistic. Um, Christian, Christianity is a system of error that has been erected by the craftiness of men who lie in wait to deceive babes who are tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. Now those winds of doctrine are seducing, come from seducing spirits. They're not just wrong doctrines, they're doctrines of demons. Anyway, when I was in that system, I was brought into bondage. And uh, one of the things, so that they're, they're, they're teaching about all this came from some people who opposed... John Nelson Darby during his day. And there became two groups, the open brethren and the closed brethren. 
the closed brethren practice separation, um, do- biblical separation over doctrinal issues that the open brethren who received everybody in the name of love said were secondary. They said these were secondary issues. There's not reason to divide. Well, I believed that while I was in that group. They ta- regularly talked about the history of the brethren and how closed-minded jo- John Nelson Darby was and he basically became a cult leader and all these different things, and I believed it. And yet, when I read his doctrine, I co- or his teachings, I couldn't see that. I, I was like, how could this person be like that? This person loves the grace of God. And, um, well, what I learned later was that the, re- the, 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 the debate was about the rapture. There were people who believed that the rapture was pre-trib and they were the closed brethren who stopped fellowshipping with people who insisted that no, you could miss the rapture if you don't mature. And then not only that, you'll be in outer darkness. If you don't mature during the tribulation, you'll be in outer darkness during the millennium. (laughs) Ah. and to, they, that was presented, but then they, we were told it was a secondary issue over which we should not divide. So you're put in fear, and yet you're not allowed to say anything about it or combat it, because now you're not being loving and you're being divisive. And all we were told was that this was just a secondary issue, and yet people were willing to separate from brethren over it. No, it directly affects your view of the doctrine of Christ and what justification is and what is the end of the Christian life, which is glorification, which is the redemption of the purchased possession, the redemption of our bodies, which happens simultaneously for the entirety of the body of Christ in the instant that Christ descends with a shout and catches us up to meet him in the air and his reward is with him. The entire body of Christ goes and you say, well, that's, deep eschatology and not everybody's going to know that true but those who were teaching it teaching wrongly on it were operating in a spirit of error and a spirit of antichrist uh and rejecting the sound doctrine concerning the person and work of christ and they were they became very legalistic uh as far as how they viewed that the christian life should be lived it was increasingly legalistic and it brought people into bondage. And I can testify that the darkness that came from that bondage, not only was it the 10 years I was in the cult, but it was the 10 years after I was in the cult detoxing from it. It destroyed everything. I had to rebuild everything. And thank the Lord for his mercy. But how did I let that in? It was through my toleration. It was my knowing. God gave me so many signs when I first went into that group that this is not healthy. Uh, and, and, and yet I didn't heed them because the good looked so good. Satan doesn't deceive us through the evil. He deceives us through the good and then he injects the evil along the way. So that's why you have to not be self-confident and think that you can stand in the way of the sinner or sit in the seat of the scorner, or stand in the way of the scoffer, and not be affected by it. I was pretty sound on justification by faith that been I could have been a, a, a contender for grace at that point. Um, I had really thoroughly seen the errors in the charismatic church and uh, the mix of law and gospel. Um, but that was the law of Moses and gospel. I didn't see that there was still further error if you tried to synchronize Paul and the ministry of the ascended Christ and what he revealed in resurrection with the synoptic gospels, which are not a new doctrine that Jesus is presenting, but he's actually teaching them the law of Moses. He's a minister to the circumcision. Some people won't see that, Um, you know. But when it comes to how the Christian life is lived, it's either of grace or of works. And you can't stand in the path of error and not be affected by it. You cannot. Uh, So it's kind of a heavy thing um, 
there are people who want to be loving to everybody. And they respond especially well to... See, I was love-bombed into that cult. They told me I was a gift from God, and I'd been rejected for 10 years in, Christ, in Christianity, you know, and uh, been labeled as a false teacher and all these different things by the system. And so I was ne I was wounded, and I needed... I thought what they had, the family, the companionship, the fellowship, the closeness that they had, the love that they showed me. But that was uh, what caught the bait they used to bring me in. And then within a year, the honeymoon was gone. And yet now I couldn't leave because I, I thought that if you left, it doesn't matter. <laughs> uh, I'd be in outer darkness eventually, you know. Um, but that's how he gets us. It's, it's not through our evil virtues. It's through our good virtues and our desire to be loved. Uh, and that's why during, you know, like the book of John, the Pharisees who believed on Jesus wouldn't associate themselves with him openly because they were afraid of being put out of the synagogue. They had too much invested in the religious system and all their friends and family were there and they weren't willing to pay that price. But Hebrews tells us that we need to go outside the camp bearing his reproach. You know, if you want the benefit of the Christian life, you're eventually going to have to side with Jesus um, and separate. There's no way to be sanctified without separating. And sanctification is not being super, super holy. It's being free. Free from all the error, from the false bail. Uh, you know, Paul talks about come out of them and be separate. He's talking about False teachers, be separate and I will receive you to myself and you'll be my people and I'll be your God. That's talking about coming out from false teachers and false doctrines who are corrupting the simplicity of Christ. And they have another Jesus and another spirit and another gospel. You cannot call, make these people your mission field. They are going against the truth, especially when you see them going in the way of Cain, the way of Balaam, the way of Korah. You know, the scripture tells us really clearly who were to mark and avoid and stay away from Jude, first John, first and second Peter. And most of the epistles of Paul were written to deal, to warn about the dogs, the evil workers, the decision to stay away from them because not because you're being mean, but because of your, you can't help anybody if you're drowning. Okay. And you know, it's through this desire to be loving and be, be, accepted by everybody in every community that a lot of people mix truth and error and endorse things they shouldn't. And eventually they will be caught up in the offense as well. I've already seen it. People who were super clear on the truth last year are drowning now. And it's through this toleration and no, I'm not going, I, I can't do that. You know, my circle is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. But you have to practice that kind of separation. That's the only way to be able to speak the truth boldly and clearly and solidly and not be moved away from it and consistently, you know, so that people actually get free. If, if I was trying to win the favor of some of these other channels and stay nice to them and stuff like that, there's no way I could continue to teach what I teach in a good conscience. Um... You know, and I'm, we have to call the stuff out, not because we're trying to attack them, but because, you know, it, Jesus didn't come for the righteous. He came for the sinners and he came for the sheep that had no shepherd and they were being beaten by thieves and robbers. You know, that's what the situation is. And the enemy wants us to have sympathy for the wrong group of people. He wants us to treat these enemies of the, uh, who are caught up in false doctrine as the friends of God and abandon the beaten sheep really and starve them out you know when big channels show more sympathy to people who are propagating error concerning the doctrine of Christ than they do for the people who are being affected by it that something's not right you know and I'm getting called out uh, because you're not walking in love these people aren't you know you need to you need to reach out to them. No. 
you don't. You, you got your eyes on the wrong people. Um, no, we don't uproot the terrors. We're not here to identify who's false and who's true. All we do is stand with the truth and then we let the consequences fall where they may. And it doesn't mean we're not walking in love. It just means that we love the truth first. If you're going to love the truth first, you love people more than the truth, you are going to be caught up in spirit of Jezebel and you're going to be following another Jesus eventually. I did it. None of us are free from it. Anybody who's been involved with condemnation because of a systematized view of the Lord that's wrong has been affected by Jezebel and doctrines of demons and Antichrist. Doesn't mean that you have a demon, but this is our warfare. And Jesus said, hold fast to what you have. I come quickly. Do not let anyone steal your crown. Do, Paul said, do not let... Uh, anyone carry you off as spoil and he said do not let anyone judge you unworthy of your prize and that's what's happening i see people carried off as spoil literally and yet they go willingly <laughs> you know uh that's the thing is that nobody can make us do anything we willingly go down paths because we compromise on the truth because we want people's favor we want their love, and we want to feel like we are loving. And if the enemy can guilt you, he's got you. Because we are manipulated by guilt. You know, you're being divisive. You're being rebellious. You're not walking in love towards those people. Those poor people, you know. No, we're not looking at people. We're looking at the truth, and we're looking at Christ. He said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw men to me. And we lift up Christ in the midst of a sea of error and let him do the drawing. And we're willing to be persecuted. We're willing to be separated. It is not cold and uncompassionate. We are not cold and uncompassionate towards those who love the truth. But to those who actively propagate error and the doctrines of demons uh, and, and increasingly more and more become hardened and darkened to where they start manifesting all the attributes we're warned about in Jude and Peter and all that then you can't run with them anymore. You can't say, God bless you. You know, uh, keep up the good work. <laughs> you can't. You have to separate. And the reason you separate is because it's so tempting to be nice to them. They're, you know, they seem like nice people. And you want their favor. So if they contact you directly and seem to apologize or seem to be nice, but don't change their view doctrinally, they don't repent, then they're still operating in an error and all they're doing is trying to seduce you. And, you know, John said, these things we write to you concerning those who seduce you. There are people who want to seduce and they're seduced themselves. They don't know that they're trying to bring you into bondage. They think they're, they're standing for the truth too. See, they, they are all, everybody's sincere in what they believe. So who, who who are you loyal to? Nobody. You have to be loyal to Jesus Christ and his word. Say, Lord, please have mercy on me that I would hear the voice of my shepherd and not follow the voice of a stranger. Ultimately, that shepherding voice will bring us into glory. But we can be caught up in error on the way. And if you do, it will bring darkness into your life. You may be standing in the truth today and thinking that you're resting in Christ. And yet if you keep the door open through sympathies and and you do not take a biblical stand to separate uh, and turn away from error, you will eventually find yourself drowning in it. And I can tell you from personal experience that I've done that several times. And the, I wish I could say the cult was the last time, but it wasn't. I did several other things that were against my conscience because I wanted the peace with the religious systems. Um, and and one I did later, I was signed a membership thing, and I knew it was against everything I believed. And yet I was tired of fighting. Once I did that, I backslid completely. And I was I, was, I found myself doing things that I didn't think a Christian could do. And it took me years to come back to the truth. You know, the spirit of error is a current that will carry you away. It is not something to be played with. This is not a game. 
Um, so <laughs> I'm going to go on this vacation for three days, but I woke up at four in the morning with a burden on this. And so I thought I'd share it. And I don't know uh, who this is. Well, I, I have a few people in mind that this is for, but hopefully everybody will take this word. It's a, it's a sober word and I really mean it. <laughs> All right, take care.